It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. I once again today have the pleasure of speaking with Chris Haley. He's the Director of Study of the Legacy of Slavery in Maryland at the Maryland State Archives. Chris, how are you today? Very well, Donna. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. You've been doing this for a while. You go around and do different presentations to different groups yes. about the legacy of slavery in Maryland. And for those of us that have missed these presentations, I now want to How hear... How rude. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you're not doing these in person right now because, you know, nobody's no. doing anything in person right now. You're doing them right. uh, virtually. So, yes, I am. So here we are, and I figured this would be a great time to figure out what it is you're telling people because I want to know all mm -hmm. about the legacy of slavery in Maryland, and every Marylander should know it. It's part of our American history, and it's part of world history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely so. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, pr primarily the focus of these presentations is just to share the, the fact that Maryland, as well as many border states, as well as many southern states, as well as many northern states, did play a role in the institution of slavery in the United States of America. And, and certainly Maryland was no different, regardless of the fact that it was bordering the, the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., and that it was in between Virginia, which was the, the heart of the Confederacy, and states which gradually or eventually became free states. So at the, the crux of what this program has tried to do over the course of roughly 17 years, arguably 20 years, including interns who worked in our first two summers in 2001, 2002, three summers, 2001, two, and three, is to devote the identities of heretofore unknown uh, blacks and mulattoes who were involved in the institution of slavery, either as being, being persons who were themselves enslaved, those who helped others to, to find freedom, who were arrested for helping others seek their freedom, and white Americans who also were involved in either slave catching, slave trading, and again, also helping those enslaved blacks and mulattoes find freedom. Because there's so many names in addition to those names which are iconic and, and well-regarded and well-lionized, well such as a Harriet Tubman or a Frederick Douglass or a Henry Highland Garnett or Thomas Garrett, who, who are so well-known and their stories are repeated over and over again. There's so many other persons who we never know of, right. but who, were, who lived day-to-day in, in this horrible experience and and whether they they could ever see the end of the light whether they had to endure it without any hope of freedom whatsoever if they had to watch somebody else in their family in their community be sold away to never find to never see them again much less know if they lived or died it, it's just it's, it's a horrible situation that they lived through, and I think the only thing we can do and, and what we tried our best to do is try to find information which confirms and brings their identities and their existences to life. I think it's, it's amazing that this is done. And they, by the way, you have your own website off of uh, Maryland State Ar Ar Archives. It's slavery.msa.maryland.gov. Yes. And there's and a database on there that I encourage people to use. Just put in any name. Remember that spelling is something that not is that you can't assume that everybody knew how to spell. So, so sometimes take it upon yourself to think, well, maybe they spelled Smith with a Y. Maybe they added an E at the end, or or or, or things such as that, which, which again we take for granted. Don't take for granted that misspellings occur, misspellings occurred, and and to take advantage of that when you use our database. Okay, um, and I have to ask you, because one part of this website, it allows you to click, well, let me see, let me go through this with you. Interactive maps sure. locate property owners yes. and slave owners. And so when I click on Anne Arundel County here, you have uh, Annapolis, Friendship, Bristol Village, Galesville, Brooklyn, Owensville, Davidsonville, and Taylorsville. Bristol Village mm -hmm. threw me for a loop, and Taylorsville is throwing me for a loop. Yeah, there's different sites. 
there's different individuals. There's different, well, primarily that. And there's different, let's say, um, like it'll even say church. It might say C-O-L apostrophe, which means colored church. Okay. Or railroad, which could be a crossing. Today it might be a post office. So these are sites that were also available, were also in existence, were also operational during the time these maps were, were chartered. And that's probably within 1850 and 1860 because some individual, either the owner of that plantation or that farm, paid to have that site included in, in the map. And then depending on which ones you click on, it may link you to a, a connected case study and or biography which will reveal that someone tried to escape from that particular site or someone or, or some event happened in that right. particular site or some iconic person was born on that particular site. It's really cool that this exists, which you already know that, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thrilled. I mean, one of the things that we still have not specifically been able to find with, the, say, a, a fine tooth comb, so to speak, for one of a better cliche, is that within studying, studying these many different runaway ads and, and uh, laws and or charges that were placed against individuals who found themselves in jail for assisting and or enticing someone to escape or run away or to revolt, we hope that someone in the future will be able to go through some of these runaway ads or documents and find a path revealed to them from the clues that are revealed in these various runaway ads, in, in which we have in the thousands, and help you with that, help you get the, you get get some more information, yes. right? Yeah, that's cool. yes, exactly. The, and I want to hear about some of these lesser known people because it's important, and it's also okay. uh, Women's History Month, so maybe focus on yes. a woman or two. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back on the fourteen thirty connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole talking today to Chris Haley. He is the director of the study of legacy of slavery in Maryland at the Maryland State Archives. All right, I want to hear about some people we haven't heard about before. One of the stories that I, I, I tell often because I feel like it's so poignant and it's also to the heart of the matter of what I feel like slavery did to to individuals and what it did to families is, is the story of a uh, Cinderella Brogdon, or I also say Cinderella, and her husband Abram Brogdon, who were a, a couple in the, the Anne Arundel County area. He was a free black from Baltimore County. She was an enslaved black woman in Anne Arundel County who actually resided, our records indicate, at the Belvoir Plantation, also called Scott's Plantation, off of, I think it's 424 in the Crownsville area. Yep, I've been of, there. Yeah, outside of Annapolis, Maryland. So, and it's not open to the public. So, I, I, as I say that, I'm not saying, that, oh, well, guys, go there for a trip because it, it, it's not. <laughs> it's right. not open. But she was there. She was enslaved by uh, a gentleman who, oh, gosh, off the top of my head, I'm not remembering his name, but um, George Worthington, I think, was his overseer. They found out, she and Abram found out that she was about to be sold by her owner. So, uh, one. Christmas Eve week, they took to escape so that they could find freedom and, and, and not be parted, since that's one of the horrible aspects of slavery, that it would break up families. Mm -hmm. And one of the many, uh, many rationale that an individual would, that would spur someone to risk their life and to risk whatever, quote, unquote, I'm going to use a security, which is certainly a suspect word, but at least the, what their existence was, the fam familiarity that they had with at least being with people they knew, was when they heard that the, perhaps the master was in financial stress or if the master was sick and was going to die and then their, whatever their property was, whether it was, um, was physical property or personal property or a man or a woman or a child who was their, their, their physical chattel, their human chattel, there could be this, this need to pay off their debts, 
which would precipitate a sale. So they tried to escape. Unfortunately, Cinderella Brogdon was found the next day, brought back and well, incarcerated for a moment before she was brought back to slavery. And then Abram Brogdon was found guilty of this act. Hmm. He was jailed for approximately two years and nine months when fortunately, because petitions were signed and put forth on his behalf by, by many residents who knew of him as an upstanding free black person who was doing this to free his wife. Mm-hmm. And that's basically how the, the uh, rationale was behind saying it was okay to defend him. It was, it was justified that he was trying to free his wife in difference to how the same petitions talked about how terrible it was to be a, a, an abolitionist, someone who was trying to, in and, of, in and of themselves, disrupt this institution of slavery. And so because of that, the governor granted him a pardon and he was freed. However, by the time that he was freed, Cinderella had already been sold south and had passed away. So that's probably the the beginning and the end of one of the most touching stories that we were able to find thanks to being able to mine all of these records, which are, as I said, runaway ads, uh, criminal Maryland penitentiary records, and things that gave us clues and then finding the, the – the parole records that showed what happened to just this one individual couple and the other persons who were involved in it in our own city here in Annapolis or the outskirts of our own city of Annapolis. Where exactly? Now, I know we have the the Quinta Quinta Alex Haley Memorial. Right. And by the way, there's a relationship between you and Alex Haley. Yes. <laughs> People didn't catch that name. He was your uncle. Yes. Where exactly were the slaves sold in Annapolis? I don't know specifically. I, I believe that at times they were sold right there at City Dock. And it could have been that they weren't even able to, to leave the, the bow of the ship. They could have been sold on, on the ship Mm-hmm. where people would come up on the board and actually survey the, the quote-unquote good, so to speak, mm-hmm. and make their purchases known then and then come back whenever they had their fees or their whatever they were paying with in hand to actually cart off their, their human cargo. But to some degree, that's where, at least in the city of Annapolis, I, I am aware of there having been, been sales actually finalized. We have to take another quick break. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. Donna Cole here talking to Chris Haley, Director of the Study of the Legacy of Slavery in Maryland at the Maryland State Archives. Chris, how long have you been at the archives doing this? I've been at the archives doing this specifically since roughly 2004. Or the summer of 2004 is when I uh, assumed this, this position, this role, uh, with an intern class of that, of eight individual intern class of that, that summer. Okay, so you've been doing this for a while. What has yes, been... a minute and like, a half. Yeah, a minute and a half. A little bit more than a minute right. and a half. You present these back when there were in-person presentations. Yes. What has been the most memorable presentation? It's, is it with the kids? It's got to be with kids, right? Yes. With kids, it's very, I think, powerful, and it's very impactful, and not only for the, for the children, but I think it's very impactful for the adults themselves because what, what I try to do with, with a child, and we do give these presentations to children as young as third grade, so that's, what, eight, nine years of age, and you do think in terms of, or at least I do think in terms of, of walking a relatively speaking fine line because you don't want a child to go home crying or to feel bad about their ethnic background or to feel uh, like their people were bad or their people were especially mistreated or what have you. You want to really focus on these individuals and what happened to them. And yet at the same time, how it could, how this is a type of situation that did address, that could address or affected children of their same age. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I often bring up runaway ads. If I'm going to a fourth grade class or a third grade class, I will find runaway ads 
which will include the children who were 12 years of age or 13 years of age who ran away with their mother, with their father, or who were captured by themselves. And it might even say that the individual was, was, says they were freeborn, and yet they were captured and they were jailed. And the, the ad would say that if this person who would be very specifically identified, and I tell kids in the classroom, I think, now think about it. You don't have your phone. You don't have, um, uh, you don't have your extra sketch. You don't have anything <laughs> with you to actually share with somebody else about who this individual is, who your best friend is, and then you find out later on that your best friend is lost. Your best friend has run away. So think in terms of what words would you use to describe to an individual who is trying to find your best friend who had run away or, God forbid, had been kidnapped. Yeah. And I have them think in those thoughts because in the 18th, 19th century, that's all there was. There was the words that were put in a piece of paper in a small ad that could be no, no larger than a, a, a calling card that your parents might have if, if they have a business that would say the person was five feet five uh, inches high and that they were, they were stout and they were chestnut colored and they had brown eyes and they had short curly black hair and they had a, a freckle on their right cheek, and they had a scar behind their left ear, and they had a broken front tooth. That's how specific some of these documents, such as runaway ads, would be. And that's all you would have to go on in order to find this individual. And for these, for these children, it usually makes a mark. It, it, it usually strikes their attention especially when I tell them that during this, this institution of slavery that your mother wasn't the one in charge, your father wasn't the one in charge. There was this other person who was called the massa or the foreman who was in charge of you over your parents, over your grandmother, over anyone else in your family who from periodic times might be there to to take care of you an older brother and sister and i have a presentation where i show the slide usually it's a powerful presentation where i click it and the word mother will disappear from the screen and i click mm. it and the word father will disappear from the screen and then i click it again and the word child would disappear from the screen just to try to emphasize for for a child that this is how brutal this this situation was that however much you may feel angry at your mother because she made you clean your room or take out the trash or do the dishes or what have you, that you still could sleep in your same bed that night. Maybe yeah. you couldn't call your friend and complain or you couldn't watch your favorite TV show, but you weren't banished from your household. You weren't put somewhere else where you can never see your family and friends again. And that's what slavery was. And that's what I try to let kids know about if they don't really understand it or if they have that sense, which, which I think many of us in our most bold and brave moments think of like, oh, I wouldn't have let that happen to me. Oh, like I would, they would have had to kill me. I wouldn't have accepted it. I said, okay, well, that's all well and good, but you're leaving people behind who probably – wanted at least the comfort of seeing you face to face on a day to day basis. And even think in terms of, of escaping. If you escape from wherever you might have been been bound to serve for life, you may never see those people again. And once you escape, it's it's quite likely that they will never hear about you again. So think about all the risks and, and in our own lives when we hear about people who are lost, when we hear about people who, I mean, for one of a, I guess, a, a totally different situation, Amelia Earhart was lost in that transcontinental fight. And to this day, we assume that she died at some point. We think maybe she died in a, in a crash, but we don't know. 
Right. So think in terms of persons who just disappear and you never see them again and you never know to this day what their final moment of life was. And that's what slavery meant to many people. Chris, I can't thank you enough for joining me again today and for all you do at the archives. It's slavery.msa.maryland.gov. Thank you very much, Donna, for having me. And and, uh, I I appreciate the fact that, that you keep bringing up the stories that you have that we can share them many times. This is Donna Cole. This is the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week. 